Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to yet another What the Bible Says About tonight. Um, we are very grateful to have each one of you here. We'd like to welcome everybody, whether it's your first time or you've been here before. Welcome. Tonight's topic will be the unity of three co-eternal persons. Um, let us, let's start with the word of prayer before I introduce our guest speaker. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us all um, through this day, Lord. Father, we are thankful that now we can just set aside this time to open up your word, Lord. And we are inviting your Holy Spirit, Father, to be in our midst. For we know that where two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, there you are in the midst. So thank you for being here, Lord. And we just ask that you please be with our guest speaker, um, Pastor Randy Skeet, Lord. Please be with his words, Lord, that it may be your words that speak through him, Lord, not his own. Hide him behind the cross, Lord. And Father, help our hearts, our minds to be receptive to your word tonight. Please remove every distraction, remove anything that may hinder us, Lord, from hearing your voice tonight, Lord. And I just pray for everybody that's on this line, Father. Please work through each one of us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Wash us clean. Um, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Give us a hatred for sin and a love for righteousness, Lord. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will be the one guiding the study, Lord. We love you and we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' loving name we pray. Amen. So Amen. a little bit of about our guest uh, speaker Pastor Randy Ski is a graduate of Oakwood University, where he studied theology. He is also a graduate of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University, where he studied for the ministry. He has conducted revivals and evangelistic meetings around the world, including Uganda, England, Australia, the Philippines, Germany, India, Quetar, Kenya, Italy, Spain, Romania, Malay, Malaysia, Indonesia, Etho Ethiopia, South Af Africa, as well as the United States. His two great loves are the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. So without further ado, we are going to pass it to our dear brother, um, Randy Ski, and it, the floor is yours, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Amen. Oh, good. All right. I thank God for the pleasure, the holy pleasure, and the privilege of being with you. And those who are watching, thank you very much. And I sincerely trust that God will speak very clearly and very simply through me. First, for his glory. And secondly, that those listening might be abundantly blessed. The subject for this evening, what the Bible says about three co-eternal persons, is absolutely essential. It is also controversial. But when the Bible is studied honestly and carefully, the controversy vanishes. Before I go any further, let me pray. Father in heaven, I ask you now to possess my mind, possess my memory, possess my mouth. Use me, Father, for the proclamation of truth, for your glory and for the blessing of your people. Bless everyone listening. If there are those listening who are not Seventh-day Adventists, Put upon them, dear God, a very, very special blessing. If they're little boys and little girls watching, put on them a sweet blessing. And Father, at the end of this presentation, let those who've listened know that they have heard from you, not from me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. In discussing the subject of three co-eternal persons, or to put it in one word, the Trinity, there are some things we must keep in mind. Even if we're simply studying the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit. In the book of Job, chapter 11, reading from verse 7, the Bible says, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What can thou do deeper than hell? What canst thou know? The measure of it is broader than the earth or longer than the earth and broader than the sea. This is Job trying to explain how big God is and how impossible it is for a human being to fully understand God. God cannot be fully understood, but we must make efforts within the limits of our humanity and with the aid of the Holy Spirit 
to understand as much of God as we possibly can. And so as you listen tonight, continuously ask the Spirit of God to reveal to you the truth that God would have you understand. Let us begin in Genesis chapter 1, and we'll read verse 1. And I'll try to keep this as simple as I possibly can. Genesis 1 verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The word God, Elohim, is plural. Clearly, more than one person was involved. We have clarity on this point in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, over all the earth. Now, look at 26 again, and we get indications of the Trinity, even though the word itself does not occur in the Bible. But the concept of three separate personalities forming one God certainly is in the Bible. Verse 26 says, let us, that's more than one, at least two, let us make man in our, the word our is plural, the word us is plural, but the word image is singular. Whether they're two or 2,000, they all have the same image. Whether you use the word essence in place of image or divinity in place of image, however many there are in let us and our, they all have the same image. The verse does not say, and God said, let us make man in our images, which would mean that there would be a variety of images among those who made the heavens and the earth, but they all have one image. This introduces us to the concept of many but one, many divine beings but one essence, one image, one God. We do not have three gods. We have three personalities, one distinct from the other, but each one fully divine. Each one possesses the God quality, if I may express it that way. And so let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. We go from the plural in verse 26, let us, that's plural, make man in our image, that's plural. Our is plural, us is plural, image is singular. And the singularity of image is confirmed in verse 27. So God created man in his own image, which means, by the way, if I may digress briefly, one of the many actually did the creating. Let me pause so that sinks in. In verse 26 and verse 1, verse 1 tells us, Genesis 1 in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Elohim, meaning more than one. Verse 26, let us make man in our image, us plural, our plural. But verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. So one of the many actually did the creating, but they were all on board for creation because we read, let us make man in our image. So when one acts, that one acting represents the others. I hope I'm not going too quickly. That one acting in verse 27, so God created man in his, that singular image. In the image of God created he him, that him is the one doing the creating, male and female created he them. So we have he, him, and his in verse 27 of Genesis 1. One of the us, one of the our actually did the creating. And we know in subsequent Bible passages, that person was Jesus Christ. But if we go back to verse 2 of Genesis 1, Let's start from verse 1 again to make some connection, but I'll pray again. Father, as I continue this delicate subject, give me the precise language I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 22, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, we have another member of the us identified. We have the Spirit identified in verse 2, and we have the Him in verse 27 who actually did the creating. We have the Spirit of God in verse 2. That's one member of that group. Then we have the one who actually did the creating. We know from uh, Genesis, uh, John chapter 1, reading verse 1, or from verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so John 1, the first three verses tell us clearly there is plurality, more than one, in verse 1, also in verse 2. But we're told very clearly in verse 3, one of them actually did the creating. We read verse 10 of John 1. He was in the world. He is singular. And the world was made by him. Him is singular. And the world knew him not. So we have singular. The who was in the world, we know it was Jesus Christ. And so if you go back to verse 27 now of Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. That person who did the creating was Jesus Christ. We know from verse 2, the Spirit was there. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, let's identify another person. Hebrews chapter 1, we read from verse 1. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 1. We like, we've identified the Spirit. We've identified the active creator, Jesus Christ. We'll identify someone else. Hebrews 1, reading from verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So we have God, and we have the Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. And so this tells us clearly that Jesus Christ was acting as the agent of God. Verse 2 tells us, by whom also he made the world. Christ was an agent of God. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. The creator Christ was the express image of the one who authorized him to carry out creation. That was God. And so we have the Holy Spirit. In Genesis 1-2, we have the individual member of the Godhead in verse 27 who actually did the creating. Then he's identified as the one who became flesh in John 1, 1 to 3, verse 10 and verse 14. And then we discover from Hebrews 1 verse 2, he did it as an agent of the Father, an agent of God. We have Father, we have Son, we have Holy Ghost. Each one is divine. We do not have three gods any more than we have three kinds of divinity. There is one divinity. And God, knowing that humanity has limited comprehension, he gives us a symbol that we can use to help us to gain some understanding of how many can be one. We go back to the book of Genesis. We'll go to chapter 2 and we'll read from verse 21. Genesis 2, reading from verse 21, and I hope, I usually ask people before I speak to ask God to put his words in my mouth. I did not do that. I was so eager to bring the truth to you, but I hope you will say from time to time, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So ask God to put his words in my mouth. And of course, I invite you to think very rigorously as you listen to God's words. Genesis 2, reading from verse 21. 
And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we have Adam, we have Eve, two distinct separate beings, but they, they participate in one thing that is humanity. They're human. Adam is fully human. Eve was fully human. Now, verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and there shall be one flesh. Adam and Eve, two distinct personalities, one flesh, father, son, Holy Spirit, one divinity, one God each one fully divine, or each one may be addressed as God, yet there's one God, one essence, one divinity. As much as Adam and Eve represented one humanity, Adam wasn't one kind of humanity and Eve another. They two were one when Cain came along. Now it became three as one. Adam was human, Eve was human, Cain was human when Abel came along. Now we have four, Adam was human, Eve was human, Cain was human, Abel was human, several, yet there are one. In the book of Genesis chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, let's look at verse 6. God comes down to see the tower and the city which the children of men build it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. Now, we have the word one used twice. It's the same Hebrew word, ekad. Behold, the people is one. That's a unified one. Of course, there might have been thousands of people. The Bible says they were one in their rebellion against God. They were one in their determination not to scatter as God had requested. They were one in purpose. They were one in rebellion. And so the Bible says, behold, the people is one. And they have all one language. So we have one use in two different ways. But the same word, ekad, is the Hebrew word. One language means numerically one language. The first one, behold, the people is one. It is one mindset. It is one attitude. It is one response to God, the response of rebellion. And so we have many thousands, and they are described in the Bible as one. Let's go to John chapter 17. Let's get more evidence for the possibility of many being one. John 17, we read from verse 11. It is one of the cardinal features of the prayer of Christ in that chapter, which is called the high priestly prayer. I'm trying to keep my eyes on the time. John 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, Keep through thy known name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. In other words, this concept of many being one does not only apply to the Godhead, it applies to humanity. Jesus prayed, I want them to be one the way we are one in heaven. In verse 20 of the same chapter, he goes on. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. Here again he prays that they may be one, that they may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So the oneness in the heavenly family, the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Son, must be reflected in this church. Even though we are separate members of the church, we are one in our worship of God. We are one in our obedience to his Ten Commandments. We are one in awaiting his soon return. We are one in believing his word to be absolutely reliable. We are one in believing that Christ is divine. We are one in believing that baptism is necessary. We are one. The oneness in divinity is reflected 
in the oneness in humanity. Why? Because God said, let us make man in our image. Part of the image of God is oneness among his people. When that oneness, and I'm digressing again, when that oneness, that unity is disturbed, the image of God is damaged. So when a church is fighting itself, the image of God is damaged. When a family is fighting itself, the image of God is damaged because part of the image of God is that many can be one. The question also arises, by the way, there is no discussion in the world of theology about God, the Father, being eternal and being divine. There is no controversy about the Father. The controversy swirls around the Son and the Spirit. Let's take a look at the Son to see if he is eternal. Then we'll try to see if the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is eternal, because our chapter is three core eternal persons. In the book of Psalms, chapter 90, 90, reading from verse 1. By the way, that Psalm 90 was written by Moses, not David. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning the Holy Spirit moved, as Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's the inspiration. The Holy Ghost led Moses to write, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Who is this person who is God? Listen to the verses 1 and 2 again of Psalm 90. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains are brought forth, that's before creation, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, the question then becomes, who formed the earth and the world? This is the one Moses is referring to, of whom he says at the end of verse 2, thou art God. But the few words before that he said, from everlasting to everlasting, Moses is trying to express with his limited vocabulary and comprehension the eternal nature of the one who formed the the earth and the world who formed the mountains who formed heaven and earth he is from ever now one everlasting means eternal moses doubles it as he tries to express to his reader that the creator of heaven and earth is an eternal being who is this person we go to hebrews chapter one we read from verse eight of hebrews one this is God speaking to the Son. Very fascinating passage of Scripture. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Did Christ have a throne before he came to this earth? Yes. The Father said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he'll have that throne again when he comes a second time. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Let's go to verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. God the Father identifies the Son. Verse 8 tells us, but unto the Son he saith. God the Father calls the Son the Creator. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. And so we have heaven, we have earth, and we have beginning in Hebrews 1 verse 10. This reminds us, us, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So when Moses wrote, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The Holy Ghost led Moses to identify the creator who's Christ as God. John chapter 1, we go back to 1. Chapter 1 of John, we read from verse 1 again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word? 
Jesus Christ tells us in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is the truth? Jesus prays in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So if Jesus is truth, he is the word. When he is pictured coming down from heaven to take vengeance on his enemies, Revelation 19, 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. The Bible tells us clearly one of the names of Jesus Christ is the word of God. And so we go back now to John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. With is a preposition establishing a spatial relationship. I'm on the right, you're on the left. We have the father and the son. The word and God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same means the word. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we have the Father. How are you? How are you doing? Good. We have Jesus Christ. We have the eternal spirit. But let's look from the Bible to see if the spirit is eternal. We go to Hebrews chapter 9. We we'll read verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, Offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. By the way, in that verse, we have the three members of the Godhead. Listen again carefully. How much more shall the blood of Christ, that's one, who through the eternal spirit, that's the second one, offered himself without spot to God. So we have Christ, the eternal spirit, and we have God the Father. But my emphasis is the Holy Spirit is referred to as the eternal spirit. Something eternal has always existed. There's other evidence that the Holy Ghost is eternal or fully divine or fully God. In John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. This is Christ referring to the new birth. You may refer to the new birth as conversion or justification by faith. This can only be done by God. Clearly, Jesus identifies the Holy Ghost as the power that brings about conversion, the new birth, or justification by faith, or the word salvation. We know from Isaiah 45, verse 22, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. That verse tells us clearly only God can save. But Jesus identifies the Holy Ghost as the power in conversion, the power in the new birth. Only a divine being can bring about the new birth. The highest angel in heaven, Gabriel, cannot do that. Why? Because Gabriel is a created being. And so we have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Ghost. Each one eternal. And so there are three core eternal persons. We do not have three gods or three essences, or three different kinds of substances, any more than we have three kinds of humanity in Adam, Eve, and Cain. We have one humanity, three human beings, each one fully human. We have Father, Son, Holy Ghost, each one fully God, or each one fully divine. But let me remind you again what I said at the beginning of my remarks. Studying God must be done with great care. Because one of the reasons God is God is that no finite being can fully understand God. We are required to know him, John 17, verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We are required to know, but we must understand that knowledge while we must pursue the knowledge of the holy, we must never pursue it with the boldness and the assumption we can know everything there is to know about God. That is absolutely impossible. The only person who knows everything about God 
is Jesus Christ. The only other person who knows everything about God is the Holy Spirit, because all three are fully divine, fully eternal. We have the three individuals again, personalities, persons, beings, at the baptism of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we have Jesus coming up out of the water. He is particularly located in the body of water. We have the Holy Spirit coming down. Jesus saw the Spirit coming down in the form of a dove. Not that he was a dove, came down like a dove. And then a voice from heaven. And so Christ was in the water. Here is this divine being descending like a dove. And Jesus sees him. And then there's a voice from heaven. We have three different locations we have three different beings or separate beings i should say father son holy ghost in the book of acts chapter 10 when peter preached to cornelius and those who came to the house to listen to peter but let me pray again father as i continue lord strengthen your grip on my mind i pray in jesus name amen as Peter preached to Cornelius and those in the house, here's what Peter said in verse 38 of Acts chapter 10. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, we have one person, with the Holy Ghost, we have a second person, and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were possessed of the devil, for God was with him. Again, we have the three members of the Godhead involved in the work of Christ, in the work of salvation, how God, that's the Father, anointed Jesus Christ, that's a separate being, with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were possessed of the devil or oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God was with him. How was God with him? In the person of the Holy Ghost. And so we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Ghost. Now in John 14, verse 16, we have that those three again. Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus prays to the Father. He's praying to someone outside of himself. And I'm stressing this because there is a false doctrine that's hundreds of years old. It's called modalism. M-O-E-A-L-I-S-M. Modalism simply says, that God is really one person who expresses himself in three different ways. So on Tuesday is a basketball player, on Wednesday a football player, on Thursday a hockey player. No, 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 no. The Bible teaches three distinct persons. And so we have three distinct persons. I, Jesus said, will pray to the Father. He will give you the Holy Ghost. And so we have Jesus praying to the Father that the Holy Ghost may come on the disciples. So we have the three members of the divine family and we have the disciples who through faith in Christ become members of the heavenly family. Let me say that again differently. When you accept Jesus Christ, you become a member of the heavenly family. And so we have Father, we have Son, we have Holy Ghost. My brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and verse 10. As it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Bible tells us clearly the Spirit of God knows everything about God. Why? Because he is as divine as the Father is divine. The Son is divine. The Father is divine. The Holy Spirit is divine. They all have the same divinity, the same essence. 
one God, three beings, each one fully divine. And that oneness, that essence, that one image that represents all three. When you have the image of Christ, you have the image of God. When you have the image of Christ, you have the image of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is an intelligent being. He is not electricity or some sort of impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is as personal and intelligent as is the Father and as is the Son. The time is almost a quarter to eight and I want to leave time for questions, but let me review briefly. This is a massive subject that requires books and books. We're only scratching the surface. When the Bible says, and in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Elohim is plural. Verse 26, and God said, let us, plural, make man in our, that's plural, image, singular. We have one image shared by several people. Each one has the same image. That's why the text does not say, let us make man in our images. Then someone can say, well, Christ has one, the Holy Spirit has one, the Father has one. All three have the same image in that sense. All three are one. All three are God. We don't have three gods or three different kinds of substances. We have one divinity. Each member of the, fam the heavenly family has the same image, the same substance, the same divinity. We discovered from uh, John 1, 1 to 3, we have the Father, we have the Word. We discovered the Word was the Creator. We know from Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, the one who formed the earth and the world exists from everlasting to everlasting. We know that that person is Jesus Christ, as the Father himself tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 10. If we go back, by the way, to Hebrews 1, verse 10, we'll see where the Father speaks of the eternal nature of the Son. We read 10 again, we go to 11 and 12. And thou, Lord, that's Hebrews chapter 1, 10 to 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Not our hands, thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Now, the Father is saying, the heavens and the earth will pass away, but you will remain. The Father is uplifting the eternal nature of the Son. Verse 12, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. There will never be a time where there will not be the sun. There never was a time when there wasn't the sun. There never will be a time where there will not be the sun. The Father himself pronounces the eternality or the eternal nature of the sun. And Hebrews 9 verse 14 expresses the eternal nature of the Spirit, and no one questions the eternal nature of the Father. We have three core eternal beings. By the way, for your illumination, I urge you to read in the book Evangelism, uh, the chapter which is about misconceptions about the Godhead, I believe it is chapter 148. I urge you, read that chapter for clarification, misconceptions about the Godhead. Now, before I give you time for questions, one of the reasons why it is very dangerous not to regard the Holy Ghost as fully God, the Bible tells us in Romans 8 verse 9, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. It is the presence of the Spirit in a person's life that identifies the person as a child of God. If the Spirit doesn't exist, if the Spirit is electricity, that person who believes that is in serious trouble. So if you say there's no Holy Spirit, then you're in a terrible condition because the Spirit is not in you and you cannot be identified as a child of God. I'll pause now and allow you to ask questions, but I turn it over to the moderator. But before I do, let me pray. Father, I hope that what I said under your guidance has opened the minds and the eyes of someone. 
to move that person to go and do his or her study of this vast and endless subject. Three co-eternal beings. As questions are posed, dear God, grant me wisdom, I pray, to answer according to thus saith the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Skeet. You're welcome. Wonderful study. Um, you ended a little early, which is fine. Or we'll open up. <laughs> That's okay. I know a lot. Elder of people... I said, cut your sermons in half. <laughs> it's okay. I know a lot of people here. I'm probably really eager to ask you questions. So, okay. if anybody would like to ask a question one by one, if you guys could raise your hand, then we will. Leland, looks like you're first. Go ahead. In Matthew 28, verse 20, where it says, Lo, I am with you all the way into, even into the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Is that Jesus? Is that the Holy Spirit? How does Jesus do that? Well, let's read the passage, Matthew 28, reading from verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake, in these, and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This is Jesus. He identifies himself. I have all power. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, here is where our principle of Bible study is so vital. Here a little, there a little. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 20, I will be with you unto the end of the world. But let's go to John 14, listen to the same Jesus speaking, and I mentioned that verse earlier. John 14, we read 16 to 18. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. The fact that Jesus says he will send another comforter tells us clearly Christ himself was a comforter and remains a comforter. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, the word another in the Greek is alos, which means another of the same kind. Someone just like me. There's another Greek word for another, which is a uh, heteros, which means of a different kind. So a heterosexual is someone attracted to a person of a different gender or sex. But the Greek word is alos, meaning a comforter of the same kind, just like me. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, yeah. whom the world cannot receive, because they see him not, neither know him. But ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Then Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Well, if he said in verse 16, he'll pray the Father to send another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, just like me. Then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. It is clearly he's saying, I will come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ also the Spirit of God. Romans 8 verse 9, he's called both. And so Christ will be with the church in the person of the Holy Spirit. Because when you have the Spirit, you have Christ, the life of Christ. It is the Spirit that makes effective the merits of Christ's intercession and atonement. It is the Spirit that applies them in our lives. Amen. Any other questions? This is the time, guys. I have a yes, question. I, I, wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, let's raise your hand. Sorry, it's because I have a few. Uh, Najila, go ahead. Yes, it's Nahila. Nahila. Um, uh, thank you. Another Bible worker um, used Daniel and the Revelation. It was page 401, paragraph 1, that had a commentary about this issue about the co-eternal nature of of the godhead and it was different and they also used that christ was torn from the bosom of the father begotten that way although it is the father's i don't i don't know if you're familiar with that in daniel and the revelation no i'm not but who wrote daniel and the revelation was it ellen white you're Uriah Smith. Okay. Well, he was not inspired. No, he, he wrote a lot of good things, but he wasn't inspired. And there were some areas where he was off and wrong. 
And so clearly, if he does not regard Christ as fully eternal and God, he is off on that point. So you cannot take that as an authoritative statement that Christ is less than God or less than eternal. We go to the Bible first to prove the eternal nature of Christ. Not uh, Uriah Smith, an uninspired person, but a child of God, don't misunderstand me, a child of God. But we, if we have to go to the human source, we go to the one who received direct revelations from God. That's Ella White. And she tells, read Evangelism chapter 148. Your eyes will be open wide. Evangelism, page 148. Not page 148, sorry. Chapter 148 of uh, Evangelism. The okay. title is Miss. I think it's misconceptions about the, the Trinity or the Godhead. Thank you. Ray, who was next? I believe Travis, was it you? Yes. I, I don't know how to raise my hand. I'm sorry. It's quite all right. <laughs> uh, thank you, Randy Skeet. Uh, I just want to say appreciate Welcome. this lesson. I, I, I learned a lot here. Um, I'm in total agreement with everything here, but one time I had a brother in church trying to convince me mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit is not equal with the Father and the Son mm -hmm. because in the New Testament letters, the mm -hmm. introductions only say the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, you see, the fact that the Holy Spirit is not mentioned is not an argument against his equality. For instance, let's go to... Uh, Numbers chapter 16. Remember the three men who rebelled against Moses and Aaron? Remember their names? Anyone? Korah. The three men who Korah. rebelled against Moses. Korah, Dathan, and Korah, Abiram. Dathan, and Abiram. Now, let's go to number 16. Let's read for verse 1. The Bible says, Now Korah, the son of Ezar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab and On, son of Peleb, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. They challenged Moses, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And God destroyed them. We know that. Now, if you read Psalm 106, Verse 17, here's what we read. Psalm 106 is a historical psalm. It tells us about God's dealing with the Israelites from the time they left Egypt. It has certain details. Psalm 107 the same way. Psalm 105, Psalm 78, and Psalm uh, 136. They are historical psalms. Now, in verse 16 of Psalm 106, the Bible says, They envied also Moses in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. The they... Are not identified in that verse but verse 17 says the earth opened and swallowed up dathan and covered the company of abiram who's missing Cora. Cora. now what are you supposed to do number 16 tell us clearly Cora, dathan and abiram were destroyed when the earth opened in Psalm 106, verse 17, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. In other words, you just have to fill in that blank. Because we know from prior information, it was Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. For instance, let's go to another example. Throughout the Bible, there are two cities used as examples of corruption and moral degeneration. What are those two cities? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. They are always used as examples of you know, uh, immorality. But there were more than Sodom and Gomorrah. It was Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela. Let us go to Genesis chapter 14. Let me check the time, make sure I don't go over. Genesis 14, we read from verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Amoriphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisa, Kedoleoma, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Admar, and Zeboim, king of Bela, and the king of Shemeba, king of Zeboim, and Bela, which is Zoar. We have 
Ad Sodom, Gomorrah, Admah, Zeboim, and Baal, five cities. Now, go to the book of Jude, we read verse 7. Jude, verse 7. Jude is the book just before Revelation. People are saying, well, Paul doesn't use the Holy Spirit. That means he's not equal. That's not a, a, a clever argument at all. Listen to Jude. It just has one chapter, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over unto fornication and going after strange flesh, as set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now we have two mentioned. Sodom and Gomorrah, but we learn, and the cities about them in like manner. Sodom, Gomorrah are used to represent the other cities. So where you see Sodom and Gomorrah, we must understand Adma, Zeboim, and Bela. This is, this is common throughout the Bible. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter, not chapter 8, sorry, Romans 13. Let's read from verse 8 and see this uh, mentioned again, or this style of writing an example of it. Romans 13, reading from verse 8. And may God give me wisdom to answer the questions from his people. O no man nothing, anything, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. And he means five commandments. He does not give all ten. Now, am I to say the other five don't apply because they're not mentioned? Of course not. When Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler, Luke 18, from verse 18, and a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal. And Christ lists five, just like Paul in Romans 13. Christ does not list all ten. Are we to understand Christ was ignoring the other 10, the other five? Absolutely not. There was no need to list all 10. Once you have five or even one, you know exactly the source from which Christ is quoting. Let me give you a modern example. You're on Pacific time. I'm on Eastern Standard Time. So it is, let me see, what time is it here? It is three minutes to 11 where I am, three minutes to eight where you are. Now, if someone were to say, I want you to identify this state, I will name some cities. The person says Los Angeles. He or she does not have to say anything else. The response will be immediately California. He does not have to say San Diego, you know, Sacramento, Fresno, Oakland, San Francisco. He does not have to do that. This is a feature of writing in the Bible where everything is not laid out, but on a previous occasion, we have all the information we need. So in Genesis 14, we have the five cities mentioned, Adma, Zeboim, Bela, Sodom, Gomorrah. There's no need to keep listing all five all the time. In Matthew 28, we have all three members of the Godhead listed, the names by which we should be baptized. There's no need to keep repeating them over and over and over, because Jesus, if you say Jesus, you know it means, Father, and Holy Spirit. When Christ only quoted five commandments, we know he meant all ten. When Paul in Romans 13 only mentioned five commandments, we know he meant all ten. When the psalmist says, death and Abiram was swallowed up in the earth, we know he meant Korah, even though Korah is not mentioned, because earlier we were told it's Korah, death and Abiram. We have to reason when we study the Bible, Come now, let's reason together, putting verse to verse the fact that the Spirit is not mentioned is no evidence that the Spirit is not equal with Father and Son. They are all fully divine because only the Spirit can bring about conversion. Only God can do that. The Spirit is fully God. Next question. Go ahead, Lucas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Skeed. Yes. Uh, for presentation. And... Uh, and taking my question, uh, Go ahead. which is um, a Job twenty six thirteen, uh, mm -hmm. trying to understand how it uh, aligns with Jesus Christ being, and I don't know if I can say the only creator, uh, as the mm -hmm. Bible is saying God is the creator, and mm -hmm. this verse, uh, the Spirit of God has made me, the mm -hmm. breath of the Almighty gives me life, uh -huh. and then there is also. Um, Oh, I think I read that was Job 33, 4, Job 26, 13. Mm -hmm. By his spirit adorned the heavens. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you're making a reference to the Holy Spirit um, being a creator. If you mm -hmm. may uh, please address these verses, I appreciate it. Well, go to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Mm -hmm. This psalm deals entirely with God working in nature, nature depending on God. Psalm 104. I want you to read verse 29 and verse 30. Okay, I'm reading from NIV. All right. And it reads, mm -hmm. He made the moon to mark the seasons. Psalm 104, verse 29 and 30. Oh, excuse me, I was reading 19. Okay. When you hide your face, they uh -huh. are terrified. When mm -hmm. you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. Mm -hmm. when you send your spirit, they are created. Ah, pause now. They, thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created. The spirit can create. God the Father can create. The Son can create. But the central figure in creation is Jesus Christ. That's why I took you to Hebrews 1 from verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth. But the, the ability to create is available to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because one of the the thing that God uses to distinguish himself from all other false gods is that he can create. But as Father, Son, Holy Ghost, each one can, the false gods cannot create. So the power to create is the preeminent defense of God's divinity. And both the Father, the, all three, Father can create, Son can create, Holy Spirit can create. And ultimately, salvation is the highest form of creation. And that involves all three. Salvation is the highest form of creation, and that involves all three. That's why we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Thank you. If you read Ephesians, go to Ephesians chapter 3 quickly. I don't want to use up your time, and my sleeping time is upon me. Go to Ephesians 3. Let's read verse 9. You can go on verse 9. nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. It reads, uh -huh. and to make plain to everyone the administration mm -hmm. of this mystery mm -hmm. which for ages past was kept hidden in god mm -hmm. who created all things keep reading ah but, but it doesn't say by jesus christ that's why that version must be watched very carefully you read the king james who created all things by jesus christ you mm -hmm. cannot leave christ out he's the central figure of creation but the ability to create is an ability that god has with the father son holy ghost Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I see it in the New King James. Oh, yes, but you've got to be careful with that NIV. I'm not yes. passing judgment. I'm just giving you a word of caution. It was okay. just the first uh, translation available in Bible Gateway. Okay. Okay. God bless you. Thank, likewise. Thank you, Pastor. Well, it is now 11, uh, well, not 11 or 3, really. You are 8 or 3, so we time, time to wrap it up. Thank you very much. God bless you for loving his word. I really mean that sincerely. Before I go... My brother, you're on the screen. Go to Matthew 12. Let me leave a parting word for God's people, a warning. Matthew 12, we read 32 and 33 as we conclude. And I want to highlight the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's called electricity and energy and all sorts of things. Matthew 12, 32 and 33. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be yes. forgiven him. Mm -hmm. but Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either mm -hmm. in this age or in the age to come. Yes. No, that's and fine. 30. It should be 31, 32, but that's fine. So okay. we have to be very careful what we say about the Holy Spirit, because he's easily offended. He's presented as being easily offended. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world neither the world to come. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, be careful what you say about the Holy Spirit, because I think verse 36 is, every idle word we shall speak in that same chapter, verse 36, we shall give account thereof in the judgment. So may the Lord bless you as you realize that the Father sent the Son, the Son came and died, and the benefits of his sacrifice are applied to us by the living, intelligent Holy Spirit. Only divine beings can accomplish that plan of salvation. God bless you. Put a double blessing on your children. Amen. Thank you, guys. Sorry, that will be it for tonight, guys. Questions, keep it for God willing next time. Um, we will close out with the word of prayer. 
Thank you again, Pastor um, Elder Ski. Um, we were very blessed by your study tonight and by the grace of God, we hope to have you again someday soon if God permits. Um, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful, Father, for yet another powerful study that you've allowed us, Father, to dive into your word, Lord, to learn more of you, to learn more of the blessing of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And Father, we are so grateful that we have the Trinity, Lord. I praise you, Lord, for Jesus, our interceder, Father. And we praise you for the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that moves in our hearts. And I just pray that as we move forward, Lord, through this walk with you, Lord, that you may help us, Father, to let go of those sins that keep us from you, Lord, and help us to continue to study your word, to show ourselves approved, but also, Lord, that when temptation arises or when the devil tries to attack, Lord, we can respond, Lord, um, with your word. And Father, we just thank you for the, for your word that is true. We praise you um, to be able, Father, to study and, and to have the Bible as a guide in this life. Lord, we pray for an extra blessing upon our, our speaker tonight, Father, Pastor Ski. Um, we pray for blessings upon him, Lord, as he goes to country to country, state to state, sharing your truth and your word with others, Lord. I pray that you will continue to use him, Father, as your vessel to speak to many hearts and minds, Lord, as he goes across the world, Lord, to share of you, Lord. I pray that many hearts and souls may come to surrender their lives to you, Lord, because of, of hearing um, you, Father, and your word. So, Lord, please be with all the families represented here. Please continue to be with us. Um, throughout this week, Lord, and prepare our hearts and mind, Lord, um, for Jesus' soon return, Lord. Help us to get ready, Father. The time is closing, Lord, and we need to get ready, Lord. So we just praise you and thank you again for this time in your word, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' loving name. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you. And, and uh, Pastor you. Keith, um, as you uh, said about the uh, Holy Spirit being, uh, being sensitive, take it as a uh, those that have maturity to understand uh, what it means, the uh, unforgivable sin, that of uh, not uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank right. you so much, Pastor. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, guys. Good night. God bless. Good night.